Welcome and thank you for tuning in to episode 34 of TLDR Podcast. Unfortunately, there are only four of us here today because Eric is working. Um, I think the Clippers are playing the Heat tonight and they're currently winning, I think. Uh, so that means a shorter podcast. So if you like shorter podcasts, then this podcast is for you. Ye. Other than that, <laughs> we have a solid episode for you today. I mean, a lot of things happening, a lot of previews, a lot of news going back and forth like crazy. Uh, but first, we got to check in with the guys, especially because, you know, it was Valentine's Day this weekend or yesterday. It was Valentine's Day yesterday. So, Tyler, <laughs> how was cooking your HelloFresh Valentine's Day soup? HelloFresh, not a sponsor yet, but uh, it was delicious. Uh, Jess and I kind of cooked it together, um, and it was awesome. Um, it was like this breaded chicken uh, with yeah, this roscata, ricotta, ice cream. ricotta, ricotta oh, cheese. Oh, my God. Uh, with la- and then we had lava cake. Uh, to go along with it. It was delicious. It was like going out to a restaurant, but we made it at home. Uh, it was awesome. So definitely recommend another it. slogan. Like it tastes like a restaurant, but at home. Hello it fresh. should be. It should be. <laughs> and soon to be sponsor of TLDR podcast. Hello fresh. Yeah. Hello fresh. Yeah. <laughs> shoot us, shoot us those DMS. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah, dude, for sure. <laughs> Alex, you know about shooting into DMS, right? I mean, you had two Valentine's day, this Valentine's day. So how was that? Dude, I did have two. One of them was my dog. So before like people start <laughs> freaking out, uh, it was good. You know, we ordered in some Thai food uh had a drink out by the fire pit other than that it was a pretty solid weekend i mean i had to work all day saturday but uh not too shabby work is good man work equals money work equals free alcohol for you that is true that's the dream (laughs) that is true last but not least trading how was your first valentine's day as a newly engaged man it was good i mean it was pretty chill we uh we, we didn't end up eating until uh, kind of late, um, but, you know, we it was not m- much going on. It was just kind of a chill weekend. We had uh, we had uh, some cousins come over and visit us, um, played some golf, um, but you know, there was just just a chill weekend. Nothing, nothing major. There was no there's no games on. So we watched. So we caught up on a lot of the shows that we've been uh, behind on. Super fun, dude. <laughs> I saw the uh, that pasta you made. Heart yeah. based pasta. Yeah. That the heart cool. the heart raviolis. Yeah. So. yeah, it was good. <laughs> Trade in. Uh uh Jess and I just started the uh, WandaVision tonight. Saw the first two episodes. Yes. It's weird. Okay, so you guys gotta wait. Episode. The first two episodes are just like are just um, like you don't you're probably right now sitting here, you don't know what yeah. to think. No. It's weird. Next episode is where things really start to I would say open up and really kind of you understand the whole whole thing, and then now it's just I mean, we're we're six episodes in, and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to the rest of it. You should be. We're definitely intrigued. I'll say that. You should be. <laughs> Alex is sitting there like, yeah, I watched about ten minutes of it when I was drunk, and I'm never watching that again. <laughs> okay, just like the Boys. Mandalorian. <laughs> I have watched the entire first season of the Mandalorian. Hey, okay. there you go. I got through the first season real quick. Haven't gone back to the second season. We're we're getting there. Oh, You'll man. get there. But There's a lot the of first season was great. I was going to say, what do you think of the first season? I enjoyed it quite a bit. Nice. Yeah, uh, a little Gilgamesh or Baby Yoda, whatever the fuck his name is, pretty cute. <laughs> what uh, did you call Gilgamesh. <laughs> what is this? Something with a G, right? What's his name? Rogu. Oh, sorry. Ashley Grogu. just watched it. It's Grogu. I just learned. Yeah. I'm going to stick with Gilgamesh. <laughs> yeah, Gilgamesh is a good one. I like that. What's a Grogu? <laughs> That's the little ba- Baby little Yoda's name. Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda. Bro, that reminds me of Gogurt. Anyway, <laughs> Gogurts. That's a blast. We love Gogurts, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, real fast, and then we'll get into the meat of the episode. So stay tuned. One. Welcome back. We're a couple of weeks into the NHL season, and news happens fast, and you might miss it. Good thing we have trading to keep you updated on the biggest NHL storylines. T, it's all you. All right. Another week. Uh, if everyone has, is if everyone's keeping up, um, I'm writing our, our uh, the TLDR pa- power rankings for the NHL. Uh, I just post. We just posted. I think yesterday. Um, I'm trying to keep up with that so you can really get to know, you know, get to know the teams, especially if you're really kind of a one team type of guy or gal. Uh, you can kind of get a good good understanding of the of the entire uh, uh, NHL. But before I get into the news, we got to go through the uh, the fantasy uh fantasy race here uh james you beat me mostly because i didn't play tristan jari yesterday <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> <a> win. <laughs> um tyler you win yeah 
uh, and Alex and Eric both won as well. And I got to give wow. a shout out to my fiance, Kylie. You won your first week. Congratulations. Hey, good job, Kylie. Um, looking at the standings, Alex, you're still five and zero. Oh. Tyler, four and one with Eric. Uh, James, you are three and two, and I sit way back at two and three. I'm not doing too well at fantasy hockey. I never have done very done very well at fantasy hockey. You really haven't. It's weird. Um, I I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I can't explain it. But moving on to the the actual NHL stuff that I actually care a little bit more about. <laughs> um, we're gonna start start up in the north we actually are two of our uh, two of our topics today are actually re- regarding the north division which admittedly is the division i'm probably focusing the most on just because my team's in that division and i hear about it all the time it's a little weird this year i have to admit because you're not playing outside your division so when you're invested in a team you really get to see just that team and and the, the news around that and it makes it a little tough to be connected with the other parts of the league and but i do my best um, I'm going to start with the Canadians. Uh, the Montreal Canadians had a, had a fiery start to the season. Um, but as of late, they kind of have fallen back down to earth. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, they're six, four, no, I know that sounds fantastic. They did have a fantastic win against the, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, on Saturday. You know, they still sit with a, with a six, six, seven say, uh, point percentage, but just things just aren't clicking to the same you know, caliber. Uh, it seems like everything was kind of working for them. Like everything was turned into gold. Like every every goal was going in. There there was double digit shooting percentage, and now it's just you know half that. Um, so it's just not looking too good. So so James, I ask you. You know, you've been following this team. It, it was you know are, was the beginning of the season a mirage, or are, are they as good as they you know kind of started out? And is this just kind of a stumble in the road? I think it's a stumble on the road. Um, I think the main thing right now, there's there's two big inefficiencies with the Canadians, and that's in scoring and in carry price. Uh, their top six forwards have not been performing in the last, what, eight games. Yeah. Philip Deneau is their number one centerman. The dude has, hasn't had a goal all season long. And Nick Suzuki, who's super promising, the first couple of games were like, oh, my God, this guy's going to be great. Him and Kyle Kanyam are going to be fantastic. He's only, he only has one goal on the season. And this is a team that has that started off super hot. They were leading the league in scoring. And I think teams have figured them out. They changed something in the offseason where they're more aggressive. Their forecheck was way more aggressive. And now all of a sudden, like people are figuring them out and they haven't made any changes to accommodate that. Changes need to occur. They got to figure out how to move the ball better or be less aggressive in the forecheck so people stop overplaying them. Uh, secondly, Carey Price. He came into the season with lofty expectations. He was supposed to be the, the guy, again, because he has been for a long, long, long time. He hasn't performed. I mean, he performed decently. He hasn't, like, what, 90% save percentage, 2.6 goal against average. Like, that's decent numbers. It's not terrible numbers. It's also not the best. It's not what he's paid to do. He's paid to do better than that. But I have an explanation for that. I'm a huge Carey Price fan, so I don't know if my explanation will, is suffice, will suffice or if it's more of a fan-based thing. But I think Carey Price needs more ice time. This offseason, they brought in another goaltender in Jake Allen, and now they're splitting time. But if you look at Carey Price's statistics, and st- like over the last couple of years, his best numbers come when he plays in 80% of the games. Currently, he's only played in 60% of the games. He's the kind of guy that needs to be out there in the groove and be out there every single night. And I get, like, theoretically, like, you're supposed to get more rest equals better play time because you're more rested, but that's just not how he works. Carey Price has always been the guy for the Canadians, and the more he's out there, the better he feels, the better he plays. So, I mean, signing a really good back goaltender is cool in most cases, not in this one. In this particular case with the Canadians, Carey Price needs to be out there all the time, at least 80% of the time, and then his numbers will show. But at the end of the day, I think changes will occur. The coaching staff is a good coaching staff. Um, they, they went really far last year. Changes are going to occur. A different perspective will happen, and I think they're going to go back to what they're used to, what they started out this year as. I mean, to be honest, they're still in second in the division of 20 points. Like, yeah. they're, they're not bad. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I would never say that they're bad. Um, I, I think that there's just something going on. I think I, I agree with you completely that the, 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 the top six just aren't playing. Um, Kakeniemi is, is, you know, not looking too sharp. Suzuki's not looking too sharp to me. To, look, <laughs> digging into this topic, I look back at Carey Price's career, and 
I don't think he's that good. I mean, I, 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 I know that's crazy, but when you actually look at his, his at his stats, he, he, we want him to be good. Canadians in general want him to be good. They, because that's all they like goalies used to become you goalies used to be the biggest thing for Canada. I mean, you look at Martin Brodeur, you look at Patrick wall, these guys, these guys are, are lauded after and Canada loves their goaltenders, but look, I don't know of any other Canadian goaltender who's even close to the, to a Vasilevsky or to a, um, you know, uh, Gibson to an extent, or, you know, insert name of, of goaltender here. Um, I think Carey price is not as great as he, as we think he is, especially when relative to his, to his dollar, to his dollar amount. That's my issue. This guy gets paid $10 million a year to play, to stop a puck. And at, and if you're saving at 90%, I have an issue with that. I don't. And to your point, James, I agree that he has played well when he's getting the the, the bigger slug of games. There's no way I'm going to give him ice time if, if Jake Allen's going to going to save 93% of shots. There's just no way. Um, so I agree with you. It's it's tough because you know, you know he's he had he had a great game um, on Saturday. I have to give him credit, uh, but it, it's tough. Um, I think that he has a lot to he has a lot to live up to because there's a lot of pressure on him. To your point, he gets paid a lot, but he needs to be better. He he needs to it just needs to be better. I mean, even if you're not getting the game the, the amount of games that you're wanting, you need you need to be better. But um, I agree with you. He needs he maybe needs to get played more, but it's tough when you're not saving the puck enough. <laughs> so it's, it's it's a it's a, it's tough. It's very tough. Um, but hey. I agree with you. They're still going to make playoffs. Don't have to worry, Canadians fans. Um, moving on to the West really quick. Uh, the Western Division is a tight race, um, you know, for that last spot. I mean, I think I talked in my preview. The top three spots are taken. Those things aren't – those guys aren't going to go anywhere. I know that I know that um, Colorado is in fourth right now, but they've been off for two weeks. They haven't even played a game for two weeks, so I'm not really going to count that. Um, I will – I'm going to let everyone know that really you should be focusing on the point percentage when you look at the standings. Um, I know the points are the main issue, but we may go down to a point where not all the games are going to be finished and you were going to be going on point percentage anyway. So it really is a better indication of how good a team is relative to the amount of games they played. Um, with that said, five teams sit just above or just below 500 or in some kind of in the middle there. And it seems to me, and I hadn't had the inclination that there were only three teams that were going to fight for the one spot, but all the Canadian teams are, are or I'm sorry, all the California teams are fighting for it. Um, you have the Ducks that are at 500. Um, so Tyler, I asked you to, to kind of look at this division. I mean, you got, you three are, are the Pacific division fans and Eric as well. Um, so I asked you, you know, who in the division has surprised you, who's disappointed you and who is going to take that last spot yeah so i think the biggest surprise right now is the coyotes um i think they i mean they're right now as we're talking here on on monday night uh they're sitting third of course you as you mentioned you kind of have to look at the games played overall uh the avalanche have not played as many games they played 12 compared to 15 16 as most of these other teams have played um same with the wild and for me the wild are the biggest disappointments here um, as they're sitting third to last um, in the division right now. Um, but again, they've only played 11 games due to COVID. So you kind of have to keep t- take that in consideration. But for sure, I mean, seeing the Coyotes there in third place ahead of the Avalanche, you know, we're almost a month into the season here. It's pretty crazy. Um, so they've done way better than expected. You know, I, I, I shit on them pretty hard in, in, our, in, our, in our preview. Um, pretty much saying they had like zero scoring. The only thing, the only, you know, player on that team worthy of any consideration was Darcy Kemper, who again mm-hmm. has put up some great numbers. He's on my fantasy team. So I thank you, Darcy Kemper for doing great. Um, but yeah, the Coyotes overall, they've looked pretty solid. Um, they might sneak in there as that four spot. Um, but I, I think you still have to keep the wild in, in, in consideration there, even though they got off to a slow start, they just haven't played enough games to kind of really show you where they'll stand. Um, the Ducks also have, have been surprising. I think they've gotten off to a slow start, but since then have picked it up a little bit. So they're right there too. Um, so I think it could be, I think there could be three teams kind of vying for that four spot in the Ducks, Wild, and the Coyotes um, versus kind of just maybe one or two as we thought. Um, so it's, it's definitely, there's definitely, it's definitely turning out to be a more interesting of a race. Uh, 
Kings and Sharks there sitting at the bottom. I don't really see that, see that change anytime soon. Uh, for me, as long as the Kings beat the Sharks and the Ducks, I'm happy with that. Um, so hopefully that continues. There you go. Uh, but yeah, that would be so. I would say biggest surprise, the Coyotes, biggest disappointment so far, the Wild. Um, I still think the Wild are going to grab that four spot in the end. Um, just considering the game's play. I still think the Wild are a better team, especially when you look at point differential. Um, the Wild currently are neutral. The Coyotes are right there at minus two. Um, so we'll see what happens, but that would be my bet. I like that. And James, you had a question, man. Yeah, this Tyler already kind of answered it. So this is for Alex and you. So as it stands now, after 15 or so games of the season, who do you think will take that fourth spot in the West? Go ahead, Alex. Um I really want it to be the Kings, but I've lost a lot of faith in them. Not going to lie to you. Um, I still, I don't like to do this, but I'm going to agree with Tyler. I think the wild are probably the fourth best team. Um, We'll see how they bounce back with their COVID issues. Um, They seem to be scoring enough, which is something we talked about at the beginning, uh, you know, when we were doing our previews. So I, if the, if they continue, continue to score enough, I think the wild are going to take that four spot. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is tough. Um, I'm I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna lean towards Arizona. I think I I really like the, the I really like the their play to Tyler's point. I really like the way they're playing right now. They're kind of kind of coming together as a group with all the kind of commotion that they that they're dealing with. They're coming together as a group, galvanizing and and making things happen. But I'll say this: um, you know, I, if your team isn't 500 at this point in in point percentage you're probably not going to make the playoffs. I think that that at this point, that's, I, I know it's not an end. I'll be all, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die on the, on, on the, uh, on my grave for that one. But I will say that more than likely that's that uh, if you're not at 500 at this point in the season, you're pretty much done because 80% of teams that are in playoffs at the, in a normal season at, at American Thanksgiving generally make the playoffs. And, and right now we're at that point, we're at relatively that point of American Thanksgiving and so if you're not in a playoff spot or at least not contending for a playoff spot, yeah, that's you're, you're, you're not probably, probably not going to make it. You, what you had, you had a question, James, or you're laughing. I want to know what you're laughing about. <laughs> oh no, I just, <laughs> I don't, I don't hear American Thanksgiving yeah. often. It's just Thanksgiving. Like a true <laughs> it's not just Thanksgiving yeah. because we actually, have, we probably have Canadian fans and there's Thanksgiving in Canada. <laughs> no. Yeah. I've just never heard of that before in my life. So that's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We got to, we got to shed, show some love for our, assuming we have Canadian fans. I don't know if we do. Um, I hope we do. Um, but yeah. So James, you, who do you think skinned that fourth spot? I'm going to stick with the ducks, man. Um, their offense has not produced, but they're coming up. They're getting way more shots on goal. And there's no way that they can only score one goal off 40 shots every single night. No. Eventually it's going to break. Eventually the dam's going to fall. And then their defense has been pretty stellar so far. So if that defense stays where it's at and the puck starts to fall the duck's direction, it's going to go in more than once after 40 shots. Yep. And so that that, if that continues, I mean, have you seen that? I don't know AHL doesn't like do mean much right now. But the young guys that the well, means a lot. Jamie Drysdale, right? I mean, for right now in this season, this point in time, right? JB Drysdale and Trevor Zegers have been killing it. Yeah, like Drys- Drysdale leads like the all defenseman in points, and then um, Zegers has like seven assists or something. It's been five games. It's crazy. Like it's, I'm very excited for them to finally make it up to the NHL so I can see him play. Yeah, I, I I worry about the the Ducks come in the next couple of years because you guys are going to lose your your high your high you know high cost veterans and you guys are bringing in some good talent down low. I'm worried about that, um, especially because the Oilers are going to be in the Pacific Division next year again. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty worried about that. But uh, moving on to the last one of the day. Four of us here during the, the during our Scotia North um, previews all had the Canucks making the playoffs and even placing better than fourth place. Wow, they are struggling immensely. Um, Tyler, if I had asked you what your biggest disappointment was, it'd definitely be this team. If I asked you about the North, um, you know I, they are just getting they they are just getting outscored. Um, Elias Pettersson looks like. I don't even know what I'm watching anymore. I don't know what anybody's watching right now. He just doesn't have his step. Alex, like they're, I mean, is this the end for them this season? Like, are they, do they have a shot? 
I mean, well, we're at American Thanksgiving, so <laughs> no, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I okay, I've done a lot of thinking about this. So, as we stand right now, like Tyler mentioned, we're on where it's Monday night. They've played 18 games. They're they're the team that's played the most games out of the season yep. so far. They're still only three points out. You kind of have to give them a margin of like two, mm-hmm. let's say two points, just because they played more games. So say they're five points out. They can make up five points. But the biggest problem, well, I mean, okay, two problems. One, they are not scoring enough. They're minus 13 in goal differential, which is not good. Um, their leading scorer on the year is a defenseman. It's, I mean, Quinn Hughes is a monster. He's an unbelievable player. But you never want your leading scorer to be a defenseman. I mean, that's just like hockey 101. And then number two, their goalie play has been, I would say atrocious would be the best word. So both Thatcher Demko, great name, uh, and Braden Holtby, who, Trayden, I got to give you some props. You pretty much shit on him during our preview, I believe. You were saying, I don't think, you know, Braden Holtby has it. And they both have... Uh, goals against average of three and a half or more, roughly, and neither one of them have a ninety percent save percentage. That's pretty bad. Yeah. Like to put it into perspective for you know people that maybe don't watch hockey, anything under a ninety percent save percentage is like you're a backup or a rookie or just awful. <laughs> like just that's just terrible. If so, I do think they have a chance. They're missing Tyler Toffoli, I think, a lot. They're going to need more depth scoring. Um, Bo Horvart has also been kind of shitty when he's been one of their better players the past couple of years. I think they still have a chance to make the playoffs. Um, I'm very confused about what Winnipeg is doing. They're in a playoff spot right now, but they feel like a team that could kind of falter. Um, but they, I give them, if it's not looking better in a week or two, I'd say it's over. But yeah, yeah, I agree. Most disappointing team in hockey so far, probably. Yeah. Um, look, they have a they have a thirty nine percent point percentage. That is, I mean, it, and and I think you're being generous. I think I I really think you're being generous for may, um, maybe just saying that they have a chance because I'm gonna say it right now. Canucks fans, throw in the towel. It's over. I, I'm I'm gonna say it. You know, it's done. Um, and you're just too far out. And to your to your point. Um, Alex, I mean, you're right. A, a negative 13 goal differential is not what this team was built around. Um, here's my here's my issue with here's my issue though. Quinn Hughes has been, I mean, he's he's amazing on the offensive side. He has a dash 12 on the season. Yeah, that's no good. Like, and if you look at if you look at some of his other advanced stats, he is he is the, letting a lot of slot shots happen when he's on the ice clearly not playing the defensive side of the puck or he's playing, he's just playing poorly. And that's, a, and that's just an issue. Um, the team, the team defense has just been absent. Chris Tanev was a big loss. Tyler to to your point, Alex is a huge loss. And Elias Pettersson has just been weird. Um, just not there. Um, one more thing to consider for n- n- the last, the last uh, topic and this one and any division for that matter, you can't get any points you know, playing teams outside your division, every single game, every single time that people are on the, that you're on the ice and you lose, you're giving up a point to a divisional rival. I mean, that's how important these games are. They're they're They've never been this big. So you can't afford to, I mean, you you don't have a chance to gain some points from elsewhere. I mean, you have to, you know, it's so much more important and much more impactful kind of to the point of, you just got to win and they, and they're not. And, and so uh, Alex, you had one more thing. Yeah. I mean, so I agree with you. I think they're in a lot of trouble, but it's hard for me to uh, kick anybody out of the playoffs. Like after watching what the blues did two years ago, True. you know, true. you win five in a row, something like that. They're back in the playoff spot. That's and then, true. and to, and to your same point, that's now taking away points from division. Rivals. 100%. 100%. So I think, I I can see your point. I when I totally get it, but I think teams if they go on any sort of run, you can go from last to first very yeah. quickly in these sort of uh, sort of things. Does Quinn Hughes remind you of Brett Burns a little bit? Like yes, kind of a a great offensive defenseman, but can be a little 
iffy on the back end. Yeah. That, like that pomp just popped into my head. Now, now I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. The, di the only difference I would say is that Quinn Hughes is young enough that he can, he's can learn that part of the game. Yeah, where Brent Burns hasn't really yet, and there, I mean, he's it, it's done. Yeah, he's not like, going he's to. Not, he's not gonna. So, um, I, I I love that um, comparison though. Um, but look, Canucks fans, I, I I love to just be you know brash, um, and I'm just gonna be brash. I, I like Alex, you know, pushing back, saying, "Hey, we don't know." Um, I'll be the first to admit that I'm wrong if that happens, but it's look not looking too good. But um, hey. You got the uh, the GM and the coach got a vote of confidence from their from the ownership. Um, last game, they you did dominate the uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, so I'll I'll give you that. Um, I'll give you that, or not the Toronto Maple Leafs. You dominated um, Calgary, and I'll I'll give you that. Um, so maybe this is a turnaround. Um, but hey, that's all I have for hockey. Lots of lots of discussion, but hey, this is going to be a fun week. Here we go. Braden, great segment once again. I generally learn so much from this because hockey and baseball, like the two sports I don't really know all that much about. So literally, like I, I enjoy listening to this stuff because I learn so much. And also your power rankings. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, tldrpodcast.net. Chain's power rankings are legit. Him and Alex both make great power rankings, so go and check those out. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to go to the hardwood, the basketball one. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing from our sponsor. That is not HelloFresh, but HelloFresh for listening. Let us know. Coming. We'll go to take as a sponsor. <laughs> it's coming. Um, much like the NHL, though, there's a lot happening in the NBA, and we're just about halfway through, give or take. Also, games around the corner. Uh, so a lot's happening in a short amount of time. Our no longer perfect basketball guy, Alex, is here to tell us all about it. Uh, Alex, damn. take it away. Yeah, yeah. So as James has alluded to, I mentioned it last week, but I've now lost two in a row Oof. in fantasy basketball. Shout out to Trayton's fiance, Kylie, who had an incredible week and beat me this week. Her team has had a huge turnaround and it's awesome to see. Um, so yeah, both. I am still in first place tied with James. Uh, we're both six and two. And then Trayton and Ty are both three and five. Got to uh, win. Got, yeah, you guys got to start picking it up pretty soon here. That's going to be issues yeah um but moving on like james said we're 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 plowing through the nba season here it's going crazy quick um and for some reason they're having an all-star game uh <laughs> don't know why we eric kind of alluded to it last week um but we didn't talk about basketball last week and i feel like we had to talk about it this week so nba is still having an all-star game voting is out now uh fans can go out and vote um it's being held in atlanta and big NBA stars like LeBron James and Kawhi Leonard have pretty much said, this is fucking stupid. Why are we doing this? This is like, this is the type of thing that could derail the season. Um, other stars have come out too and pretty much said, great. You know, it's an honor to be voted an all-star. Why are we all traveling? You know, it's pretty much breaking protocol and they're all coming together in Atlanta. Um, so trade in, you were kind of, Task to talk about this. What are your thoughts on these stars making these comments? And then what are just your personal thoughts on an all-star weekend festivity? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, look, the NBA is kind of pride. It has pretty much been, ha has one of the, probably the most outspoken, um, you know, players, or I guess you could say employees of, of any sport of any of the top four anyway. I mean, they, they do speak their mind and they, and they're encouraged to. Um, and, and I appreciate that. I mean, I, um, you know, I may take exception to some things that are said or whatever, but who doesn't, I mean, that's just part of it, but, but they have every right to, if they're given the right in the platform, they have every right and they have every right here. I mean, they are, they have some good points and, and to, you know, I'll, I'll answer the second question. I think that, they sh why I don't have any idea why they're doing this. I mean, it, it just, it seems absolutely stupid um, to, you know, break protocol to, to, to shift around to things. There's so much logistics surrounding it that it's, it's not worth it. And I know it's for the kids and I appreciate that. Um, that's what all-star games are for, right? They're, they're for the kids. They're for, they're there to showcase the, the play, uh, the, you know, the league's best in, you know, other things. And it's just, it, for, for this type of, you know, for this type of season, it's not worth it. Um, especially when, you know, with COVID being such a big issue, if you, if you ruin that, you ruin the whole season 
and it, it's completely over. It's not just a one team thing. These are this is the entire you know the bigs of the bigs of each team coming together. So I I don't think that this is a this is a fantastic idea either. However, I do have a good idea, kind of similar to what the NBFL did. I think this is how they should do it. They continue doing the voting. You vote for the all stars, but. Because I think we still need, I still think that a break needs to be had. Like give them a, a, give them five to seven day break. Like just let them just chill with their families, chill at home, you know, just relax because this season has been just absolutely bad shit. You need to be, you need to be, you know, you need to pump the brakes a little bit in the middle of the season. So here's how you do it. You vote for the all-stars and I'm pretty sure I don't, I've never played NBA 2K, but I'm pretty sure you can play as one player. And I think that LeBron plays as LeBron. Cool. Uh, Steph plays with Steph and they play and they play five on five, like, like NBA and they're passing to each other, shooting right at their own homes. They have the, they have the, the zoom going so that, you know, fans can be, can be engaged. Um, you don't have any issues with, with COVID and you can, and you can let the, you know, you can let the engagement between the fans and the, the players kind of still be there in, in some way, but don't, don't bring them all to one spot. Just, just don't bring them all to one spot on Zoom. The people can be involved with that. I think, I think that's what they should do. I think I, w- I would even maybe tune in on that if I could see Steph like you know talk shit to, I don't know whoever's on the other side. You know whatever. I think it'd be. I think you can still have that without dealing with the COVID issues. Okay, James. I know we you were not you talked mad shit about the NFL Pro Bowl and how they played Madden or whatever. Do you now hate Train's idea because it's pretty much the same? No. Thing? So you like it like better in basketball, but you didn't like it yes. in football. Okay. Correct. Uh, main reason being is that he made a good point that each player can play as himself. In yeah. the NFL, in Madden, like, you can have an offensive lineman do what? Like, he's going to be himself, but he's going to, what, sit, stand there? Like, you do absolutely nothing as an offensive lineman playing Madden. But on the NBA side, that'd be pretty fun to see. <laughs> uh, so seeing fun. how competitive – these guys play a lot of 2K anyway. Uh <laughs> The main point of contention there is going to be a lot of unhappy players when they see the ratings, because not everybody is going to be 99, but everybody who's in the All Star game thinks they should be 99, but they're not. There's going to be like what two players who are 99. It's probably going to be LeBron and Good. yeah, I did somebody else. Like people are going to be pissed, and it's going to show in their gameplay because it's a it's 2K man. It's a game. Like if you're going to be the better ratings wise, if you're better, you're going to dominate like the other person you're playing in real life there's always that theory of chance <laughs> in the game. Not so much, uh, but I still think it's fantastic. It's a good way to get people together. It'd be fun to watch. I put down bets for that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, there's that, the revenue driver right there. You bet on everything. Dude, yeah. that's true. Uh, now that you're saying that trading, I feel like the best part about, I mean, the NBA all-star game is stupid. Like let's, let's be completely honest. Even non COVID there's zero defense. The score is like 195 to 190. It's stupid. The dunk contest, on the other hand, yes, fire. They could easily do a dunk contest over Zoom. You oh yeah, it's just one guy. I would love to see Alex Caruso as part of a dunk contest. Yes. Like, <laughs> how great would that be? So every player just picks the most, un- or every team picks the most unlikely player. Every all thirty teams have a dunk contest participant. Oh, dunk. I I love that too. I'd watch that in a heartbeat. I like that idea. Like showcase the players that don't go to the M- yeah M- you know and for doing a go- I love that I love that okay NBA I hope I you're think, listening I th- hold up real fast right. instead of picking the person who like doesn't really look that athletic I think they should have a contest to see who has like given most back to the community and then that person gets to be in the dunk mm-hmm. contest I like that too so I like, like that some one. good comes out of it. yeah yeah I like that too but. Kind of like the Walter Payton Man of the Year, but exactly blah 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 exactly dunk of the year done. <laughs> we, we we figured out the NBA All Star Weekend, boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on. So we're halfway through the season. MVP talks have kind of been brought up. I'd say there's probably four, three or four kind of headliners: LeBron, Jokic, Joel Embiid, uh, Kawhi. Maybe um, someone we're not talking about that much. I mean, we have talked about him, but the NBA, has, he's not given a whole bunch of love. Steph Curry. And if you look at his numbers, his numbers are almost identical to when he won back-to-back MVPs in the mid-2010s. Granted, his teams were elite. He had elite company. He doesn't have that now. I mean, he has Draymond. He has Wiggins. He has Oubre, who I've continually shit on this on this podcast. 
Bro, he put up 40 the other night. You see that? Dude. Uh, a TLDR bump. I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> uh, so this was supposed to be kind of Eric's thing, but I'm gonna let all the boys talk about it. Uh, is because the Warriors are in eighth place in the West, they're probably not gonna crack the top six. I would imagine in the Western Conference, does Steph deserve some more love in this like kind of mid-season MVP conversation? Uh, Absolutely. Tyler, first. Oh, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you guys are all yeah, well, uh, what 100% he does. And this goes to, you know, the age-old debate of, like, what does valuable mean, right? And typically, especially in the NBA, it goes to, like, the best player on the best team. And I think in some certain – in some cases, like, that should not always happen. I think S- Steph Curry is very valuable to this Warriors team. Without Curry, this Warriors team would be a lottery uh, pick team. Like, they, they would be horrible. Um, just some stats to back that up. Um, the Warriors point differential with Curry on the floor is plus 66, which is um, ninth, ninth in the league. And they are minus 33 without um, their offensive rating is um, 112.5 with Curry on the floor. And without them, it's 99.7, which is five points wow. fewer than fewer than the league's worst offense. Um, so that is just, that's value right there. I mean, how it doesn't get much, you know, better than, than, than that. Um, I mean, the fact is, you know, this team isn't the best team in the Western Conference, but they are a playoff team. I think there's a very real shot that they will make the, po- the, the, the playoffs. Um, and Curry's going to be 100% the reason why they do. Um, I think he is the most valuable player in, the, in, the, in a contending team than any other player. I think there's a lot of players that are still valuable, but in terms of just the difference of with or without the out of player, I mean, Curry's got to be the guy. And Alex, as you mentioned, his numbers are pretty much identical to when he did win MVPs. Um, I think Steph Curry deserves not only a nod, but I think, honestly, is probably the front runner right now. Wow. James, I cut you off. What are your, what are your thoughts? The biggest problem I have with the MVP award is that it looks at offensive numbers and just offensive numbers, that's it. Nothing else. Most valuable player means, yeah, you're good at offense and you're good at defense, but you're also a leader on your team. And that's what Steph exemplifies the most. He like has. Have you ever heard of somebody saying like, hey, man, I hate it, Steph as a teammate? No. Nobody's ever said that. That probably has never been spoken ever in the world. Like, Steph is a good guy. You see it on the court, you see it off the court. He's all smiles all the time, and he makes good plays. Like, what is the most unselfish play in basketball? Pass. Anybody? wrong at setting a screen <laughs> setting a screen is the most unselfish thing it doesn't show up on, on the stat sheet like you don't know if you, nobody ever knows if you set a screen if you don't watch the game and what it more often than not the ball doesn't go to you you flip somebody else that makes a shot or gets open and steph does that he's a superstar and he's a point guard who's small he shouldn't really have to do that but he does that anyway for the betterment of his team and because it's part of the offense that's what Steph is all about. He's all about making his team better. And yeah, his stats on the offensive side show that he's elite too. But the fact of the matter is you can have some scrub guy coming off the bench sitting at the three-point line or cherry picking the entire time. And he's going to have great offensive stats. If he doesn't play the defense, he's going to be sitting on the other side and make 100% of the shots and maybe score 40 points a game. Doesn't mean he's the MVP. You have to look at more than just offensive numbers if you want to look at the MVP. And Steph exemplifies that the most. I like that. Trayden, any thoughts real quick on Yeah, Steph it's MVP? it's really tough to follow these two, Tyler and James, because they pretty much nailed it nailed it. Um but I, I you know, to, to James's point, I mean, yeah, he's he, he he exemplifies the leadership style that, you know, is is the biggest thing for me. I mean, I, let's look at the other t- let's look at two players in, in in particular that kind of are kind of wowing us right now, in my opinion, or wowing me anyway. Uh Ubre. He's. I mean, I'm not saying that 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 Steph's necessarily making him shoot better or, or play better, but you know, he's he's here, Curry's here, and Ubre is actually playing pretty damn well. And I think Alex, you can admit that. Like he's he, and you you had some issues with him early, but he's playing pretty damn well right now. Puts up 40 points the other day, fantastic. And I think Draymond Green's playing fant- playing pretty good basketball right now. I mean, I, he's playing, he's being effective. He's he's and he's able to he's able to have that kind of you know engagement with Steph I I I think to to James's point you're you're right um I think that Steph's a big part of that um so I mean I I'm I'm with you Tyler he's front runner for me dang okay James one last thing 
Yeah, I just want to talk about the Warriors as a whole uh, and them making playoffs and their success. They're doing pretty good right now, and they're doing it without any bigs. Their biggest guy is Jamon Green. James Wiseman has been out for a long time with a wrist sprain or something. And their other guy, I forget his name, but he's a pretty integral part. He's also out. So they're, they're down two big men. They play with a small lineup each and every day with Draymond at the five, and they're still doing relatively well. So that tells you that once James Wiseman gets back, because, dude, James Wiseman as a rookie, not even as a rookie, James Wiseman as an NBA player is good. So when he gets back out there, they're going to be a little bit of a, more dif- of a different team and a more complete team, so I see more success in their future. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can say Steph is the front runner right now. Um, I probably have to give it to Joel Embiid. He's probably the most complete offensive and defensive player right now. And as as Tyler mentioned, the voting go they you know the Sixers are in first place in the East, um, and he's had a great year. So, but Steph top top five MVP voting for sure right now. And uh, you know Tyler, you're also right. If it's without Steph, this Warriors team is terrible. I mean, they didn't have him last year, and they were the number they had the number two overall pick. So like. Boom, done. Argument done. Steph Curry's amazing. Love that dude. I, he's probably also one of the most likable players in the NBA. Easy. Easy. Like, even when they're winning all the time, you're kind of like, okay, KD's kind of a little bitch for joining this team. But, like, dude, you love Steph. Like, the shimmy, the smile. What a guy. What a guy. <laughs> uh, moving on to a team that's been disappointing, I would say, um, the New Orleans Pelicans. So, Brandon Ingram gets tra- – they get – you know, they trade Anthony Davis – they bring in all these guys from Lakers. Brandon Ingram has an amazing year last year. They bring in Zion. They have all these guys. The Pelicans were like a dark horse. Kind of they could be like a six seed uh, coming out of the West this year. They're currently a 12 seed. They're four games under 500. Um, Tyler, what has gone wrong with the Pelicans, and what do they need to do to change it? Or is it time to blow it up again and start out to try again? So I think the number one thing that's wrong with the Pelicans is their turnover rate. Um, They're just not a very high IQ basketball team right now. They're making very, very dumb plays with the ball. Um, They're turning the ball over 16.1% of their possessions, which is actually worse than last year. Um, So that to me is the biggest issue. And for me, like, yeah, they have Zion, who's a stud, but I think there is too much stock in this guy kind of carrying this team to the next level I don't think there's enough around him yet to be able to support Zion. To, to be able to support Zion, um, there's you know Brandon Ingram. I mean, he had a great year last year. He got a, he got off to a good start, but since then hasn't been that great. He, he and he's one of the you know number one culprits of of turning turning the the, the, the ball over. Lonzo Ball. I mean, what are you gonna do? I mean, there, there, I don't think there's enough supporting cast around here for for Zion. And Zion is still young too. I don't think he's reaches. Um, full potential. I think this team as a whole is too young, and they're they're just not ready. They're they're not even close to contention. Um, for me personally, like I never thought this team was legit, um, just because of their youth, and th- there's just not enough there yet. Especially in this Western Conference that is so stacked. There's so many great teams in this conference. I mean, they're just being overmatched and overplayed every single possession. Um, this team has a long way to go. They got to be way more. They have, they have, they, have, they have to be smarter with the ball. Um, and that's just going to come with experience and it's going to come with, come with development and they need to add way more veteran presence. I mean, they just, they're, they're too young. They just don't have what it takes to be that upper, upper tier of uh, postseason uh, basketball right now. Not, not even close. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there already been trade rumors, JJ Redick possibly going to, you know, kind of the one veteran guy on that team um, other than like Steven Adams um, getting traded to one of the New York teams. Lonzo Ball has been rumored to go to the Clippers, which would be really weird. Wow. Uh, <laughs> like After starting in L.A., going to New Orleans, coming back to L.A. Yeah, I agree with you. The, um, there are still – I mean, even Brandon Ingram, he's been in the league for five years, but I think he's like 23. He's – you know, they've yeah. everyone on that team, they got a lot of growing up to do. I think Zion's maybe 21. Um, they are very young. I, I'm not saying I didn't, you know, as my kind of predictions came out at the beginning of the season, I didn't think the Pelicans were a title contender by any means, but I thought they'd at least be fighting for a playoff spot. Um, I'm pretty disappointed in them. Um, I think they can be better, but yeah, they've got, they've got some growing up to do. Look at, look at them two or three years down the road and we'll see what they see what they're looking like. Uh, last topic. We're moving 
over to the Eastern Conference. The New York Knickerbockers, speaking of players with Dark Horse MVP candidates, former Laker Julius Randle, Dark Horse MVP candidate. To put it in perspective, the the Knicks are a half a game behind the Pacers and the Celtics. Half a game. The Celtics are should be legitimate title contenders, and the Knicks are a half a game behind them. And they're getting reinforcements, and they're getting reinforcements in a true vet in Derrick Rose. He's going back to New York. So, James, you and I have talked about the Knicks quite a bit on this podcast so far. What can D. Rose bring to the Knicks uh, coming back for a second stint there? A lot. And I, I mean a lot. I think this trade signifies their push to make the playoffs and to do well in the playoffs. I mean, there's no other reason why you bring a 32-year-old, injury-riddled Derrick Rose to a team of youngins. who He's taking away time from somebody who needs to develop and the reason being is because he's in there to produce and help them win games to put them in the playoffs. And I talked about this with Steph Curry and leadership. Derrick Rose is a leader through and through. He's been there. He's done that. He's done pretty much everything. He's been through a lot of injuries, man. Like, he's fought adversity. He's wrestled with the idea of retiring because he's never going to get healthy. But came out on the other side and has a renewed and invigorated love for the game. That tells you all you need to know about this guy. Like, he's... He knows how to lead a team. He knows how to lead himself. And a lot of leaders need to learn how to lead themselves before they can lead everybody else. And he's done that. And you've seen it throughout the years. Like he was, he was, an, he was the youngest MVP winner of ever at 22 years old. He won the MVP with the, with the Bulls. Like he's a damn good player. Unfortunately, the card just did not have him fall and fell the way he wanted it to with the injuries. And he, the last couple of years though, he's been really good. Uh, this season, especially he's good for 25 minutes off the bench and he's good for 20 points and like six assists per game. That's huge reinforcements right there. Um, like I said before, he's taking away time from people who need development, and that's because he can produce. Um, secondly, like he's played with Tom Thibodeau before, and they did well with the Bulls when he played for him. He's the kind of guy that can be a coach on the floor and help you through tough moments. And I think his uh, coming to New York couldn't have come at a better time. Mitchell Robinson is out for an extended period of time now due to a fracture. And he was a big part of that of that team. And he was a big leader. Uh, Derek Rose can get in there and step in right away and help them through this storm. Uh, he's going to help them lead. He's going to lead through the injury and hopefully continue to lead throughout this playoff push. And I think it's huge. Yeah, I mean, obviously, anyone thinking this is twenty two year old Derek Rose is mistaken. I mean, he's not the guy who won the MVP. Too many injuries to his knees. And he's, you know, one of the most, it's one of the most unfortunate injury riddled players in NBA history. I mean, for a time there, it was Derrick Rose or LeBron. Like, it's going to be a battle in the East for a really long time. And unfortunately, just like you said, it just didn't really fall in Derrick Rose's favor. But I, I agree with 100% of what you just said. He can be a leader on that team. That team is also still very young. Um, and they're going for it and good for the Knicks. It's good for basketball when the Knicks are a good team. They're kind of like, the Cowboys, where they kind of seem to be always bad, but they get talked about a lot because they're in the New York media. Um, and I think the Knicks have a good shot of continuing this success and making the playoffs, which would be which would be cool. I mean, the Knicks have been terrible for forever, uh, at least in like our lifetime. So uh, good for good for Derrick Rose. You know, get out of Detroit because the Pistons are just awful, um, and get a shot to make the playoffs again. Uh, but that's all I got for basketball. This week, uh, we'll see how this whole all-star thing pans out. NBA, just telling you, dunk contest over Zoom. TLDR boys got to figure it out for you. So That is probably our best idea ever on this podcast. I really <laughs> hope one of us sends it to the NBA because, yeah. dude, we yeah, have NBA. Yes. <laughs> Anyone has Adam Silver's oh email, like, let us know. And we'll, you know, we'll get that over to him. A quick. silver at NBA. Or, or you can send it. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be that. It's be that. <laughs> Alex, great segment once again. Learned a lot. Uh, one, we'll take another quick break, but when we return, we're going to baseball. One. Welcome back. Guys, the Angels are projected to be second in the division. What? I have no idea how that's a thing, but I'm super <laughs> glad that it is. Also, because I'm talking about baseball, it means baseball season is around the, right around the corner, which means we get a division preview brought to you by Tyler. Take it away, man. Sure. Yeah, we'll be talking about that AL West division next week. Um, but boys, spring training is starting this week. Um, I'm super excited for that. Pitchers and catchers report. 
Um, so baseball, like as James said, is right around the corner. Uh, we talked about the AL East last week. This week we're talking about the AL Central, which was one of the most tightly competitive races in 2020. Uh, the top three teams all finished within one game of each other. Um, this season, I think it's not going to be a three-team race, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so we'll start off with the reigning AL Central champions, the Minnesota Twins, who in 2020 uh, finished first with a 36-24 and 24 record. Um, they lost in the first round to the Houston Astros uh, to extend their playoff losing streak to a North American sports record 18 straight games. Um, I'm going to ask James about that a little bit later. Um, but let's look into what they've done this offseason. They, pre- they were pretty busy. Um, first, they lost a couple of uh, their big starting pitchers, uh, Jake Odorizzi, left in free agency, and Rick Dick Mountain Hill uh, is also gone. Um, but they re-signed their DH, Nelson Cruz, the 40-year-old wonder, uh, still is still killing it. Um, and they signed some veteran leadership. Uh, they signed shortstop Andrelton Simmons. Uh, they signed relief pitcher Alex Colom. And they also signed left-handed pitcher J.A. Happ. Uh, Their projected rotation is as follows. uh, Kenta Maeda, Jose Barrios, Michael Pineda, J.A. Happ, and Randy Dobnik. Uh, Their projected lineup, uh, the catchers will be Mitch Garver and Ryan Jeffers. First baseman, Miguel Sano. Second baseman will be Alus Arias and Jorge Polanco. Uh, Shortstop, Andrelton Simmons. Third baseman, Josh Donaldson. The outfielders will be Max Kepler. Brian Buxton and Alex uh, Kriloff, and the DH is Nelson Cruz. Uh, the bad for this team, they lost some experience on the pitching side, as I mentioned. Um, some injury concerns for this lineup, um, especially with those older guys, Josh Donaldson. Um, and um, the postseason play has been absolutely pitiful, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that series they had against the Astros was one of the worst postseason performances I've ever seen in, in recent memory. They couldn't pitch. They couldn't field. They couldn't hit. I mean, it was it was horribly awful. Um, but the good for this team is that on paper they are one of the most well-rounded teams in baseball. They have a great bullpen. They have a great lineup, and they have great starting pitching. Um, they have a good mix of young talent with with some good veteran leadership. Um, so this team should be great again. Um, James, I want to ask you: the Twins added some good um, veteran leadership in all parts of their of their team. Um, their bullpen, their pitching, and their lineup. Um, of the guys, Alex Colom, J.A. Happ, and Andrelton Simmons, which of those players do you think will make the biggest impact on this team? I want to say Andrelton Simmons. Just He's one of my favorite players of all time. Um, but I think they all have an impact in different ways that all adds up to a great season for the team. I mean, they all play different positions, right? Um, Colum is a relief pitcher. Jay Happ is more of a starting pitcher. And Simmons is on the field. So they have different leadership styles that will defer to different spots in the field depending on where they're playing. So I think that having the combination of all of them, they're all experienced players, will have a, a really good impact on this team. Overall, I hope that it kind of breaks that 18-game slump that they're going through. 18 games in a row is kind of hard to do. It's hard to do winning or losing, yeah. eventually it's going to have to break. And this team being as well-rounded as it is, having a lot of the same guys as last year, um, minus a couple, I think that leaves a sour taste in your mouth and bringing along some veteran leadership. I mean, Simmons hasn't really won anything ever because he's been with the Angels, but he wants to win because he's been with the Angels. So I think that's going to help him out and give him that little chip on his shoulder. Um the one thing I do have a concern about, though, is the catchers. Mitch Garver came into last season, before season, hot. Like, people loved him, thought he was going to be great, but he disappointed wholeheartedly. And I think he's going to – he, in my opinion, is the one iffy, sketchy spot on that lineup, and I think he needs to figure it out if they want to have the success that's warranted. Yeah, absolutely. And Max Kepler was very disappointing after a great 2019 campaign – uh, Ryan Jeffers is their uh, young young catcher who kind of stepped in and had a much more productive season in 2020. So we'll see how they do. I think I think they're still going to give the nod to Garver in the beginning, but if he gets off to a slow start, I think they might uh, push it full full time to to Jeffers. But I agree with you. I, I think Simmons of all those guys that they sign will make the biggest impact. You know, I had him as one of my most underrated baseball players in the game right now. Um, he's an amazing de- 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 defensive shortstop and an underrated offensive player. 
And he doesn't need to be, you know, their stud in that lineup. He just needs to be, you know, a contributor. This lineup is already great. Um, so for me, my prediction, I think this team is going to win 96 wins. I actually think they're going to be the best team in the um, American League um, and they will win the division. And dude, I hope that they snap that 18 game uh, uh, playoff losing streak. It, 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 it needs to be snapped. And you know, like I said, I mean, the, the last year's postseason was absolutely horrible. I don't think it can get, it, it can get much worse than that. So uh, Twins will win the division in 2021. Uh, moving on to the team that finished second, the Cleveland Indians. Um, in 2020, they finished 35 and 25. Uh, they also lost in the first round to the New York Yankees. Uh, in the offseason, they lost Francisco Lindor and Carlos Carrasco in that big trade to the Mets, and that's pretty much it. So uh, they didn't really do anything else. Uh, the projected rotation will be Shane Bieber, the reigning AL Cy Young, uh, Zach Plezak, Aaron uh, Saval, Tristan McKenzie, and Logan Allen. Um, some really good young pitching there. The lineup is going to look a lot different for the Indians this year. The catcher, Roberto Perez, first baseman, Josh Naylor, second baseman, Cesar Hernandez, shortstop, Andres Jimenez, third baseman, Jose Ramirez. The outfielders will be Eddie Rosario, Oscar Mercado, and Daniel Johnson. And the DH will be Fran Mil Reyes. A uh, lot of unknowns and not hearing, you know, um, Francisco Lindor is the shortstop is still very weird. Um, the bad for this team, as I mentioned, they just traded away their franchise player in, in Lindor. Um, this lineup looks pretty pitiful past that middle three. Um, just offensively, I don't think this team is very good at all. The good is the starting pitching will definitely keep them competitive. They got the reigning AL Cy Young. Um, they got more young starting pitching coming through the system. It seems like they always have good pitching. Um, so they'll still be competitive. Um, so I kind of had this team for me. Um, so my prediction for this team, um, I don't think they're going to be very good. I think they'll finish at 84 wins. So they'll still have a winning record, but barely. Um, I don't think they're going to be nearly as competitive as, the, as, as they've been. Um, and they'll finish third in this division. Um, they will not make the playoffs this year. Um, as I mentioned, I think trading away Lindor and, and Carrasco um, is going to be a huge loss for them. And they just do not have the offense to be able to be able to compete in this division. Um, so moving on to the third place finishers in 2020, the Chicago White Sox. Um, as I mentioned, they finished third with a 35 and 25 record tied with the Indians um, last year. They made the playoffs as well, but they also lost in the first round uh, to the Oakland A's. Um, and in this off season, they're probably their, one of their biggest moves was hiring uh, Tony La Russa as manager, which was a little bit controversial. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, they signed top, top re relief pitcher, Liam Hendricks. Um, they signed outfielder Adam Eaton and traded for starting pitcher Lance Lynn. Uh, their projected rotation will be Lucas Giolito, Dallas Keuchel, Lance Lynn, Dylan Cease, and Carlos Rodon. The projected lineup, it's a good one. Catcher, Yasmani Grandal. First baseman, Jose Abreu, the reigning MVP. Uh, second baseman, Nick Madrigal. Shortstop, Tim Anderson. Third baseman, Johan Moncada. Outfielders, Adam Eaton, Luis Robert, and Adam Engel. And the DH will be Eloy Jimenez. Uh, the bad, um, the leadership shakeup in manager. Um, I don't really agree with it. I don't think it was a good move. Um, starting pitching for this team is good, but not elite. So I don't know if it'll be good enough to go far in the postseason, um, but it is a little bit better, I think, than it was last year. Um, the, the good for this team, uh, this team just keeps getting better and better every year. Uh, they, they made a big stride by making the postseason for the first time in a long time. Um, They're well-rounded. They have more pop and flair than any other team. I think that maybe the San Diego Padres. Um, Alex, I assigned you these Chicago White Sox. I first want to ask you about the managerial decision um, to hire Tony La Russa, a very, very interesting uh, hire in, 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 in my mind. Does this managerial, I mean, they just made the playoffs last year and they decided to hire a new manager, a, a, a manager that hasn't uh, managed in the big leagues. I think in, I think it's 12 years he's, he's, he's last managed. Um, are you concerned about that hire and the fact that the White Sox felt like they needed a change in that leadership role? Yeah. You know, Tony La Russa is a Hall of Fame manager, um, but I'm not, I'm not pleased on this one. Um, he's had some questionable comments in the past. Um, he's had some DUI issues of late, um, which is, you know, never a good thing. And he's in his seventies. Um, you know, look, yeah, look at, look at, teams that have succeeded dave roberts 
he's in his mid forties. The Rams, Sean McVay is younger than half the players on his goddamn team. <laughs> like some, you know, you want guys, managers, especially in baseball. Now the front office has so much to do with lineups and day-to-day things. You really want a manager that can relate to your players. Well, this manager is 40 years older or more than every player on his roster. I was, uh, surprised I would say that they hired him I thought there were some better candidates out there he's obviously has he's managed before he's won World Series before um, we'll have to see how it goes um, I didn't like it, it doesn't, you didn't like it I would say the majority of the baseball community was questioning it at best um, so yeah we'll, we'll have to see um, the team is very talented though so yeah James you had a question yeah, Alex and Tyler, in your opinion, why was the manager of the White Sox removed after this last season? Uh, so for me, the way I understand it is, uh, so Ricky Renteria was the manager last year. He actually finished, I think, third in AL Manager of the Year voting. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I think they were just looking for more experience. I think they felt like this team – was at a place where they wanted to go the next level, which was compete for a world series, not, not just make the postseason, but win a world series championship. Um, and I think that what they wanted was a manager that had experience winning a world series championship, which Tony Larusa definitely has. He's won several, but as Alex mentioned, he's 76 years old. He hasn't managed in a very long time. And the times that he's last time he's managed a lot has changed in the game of baseball. And the biggest issue I think for him is going to be able to relate to these young players and uh, be able to adapt to the change. And most people in baseball, as, as I was mentioned, would agree that this probably isn't the, the best hire. Now, he might surprise us. Tony LaRusa has been very successful as a manager, so he might still do that. But I don't know, man. I think times have changed since he last managed. I don't really see it going well. Alex, do you have any uh, further comment? Yeah, I pretty much agree with what you said. I think it was one of those things where when Rick Renteria was let go, it was a um, – what, what, how do they word it? They, you know, they both parties agreed to part ways or whatever. Um, and yeah, like, you know, Rick Renteria obviously did a great job. The, you know, the White Sox weren't, they were on the cusp of being a playoff team. And, you know, maybe without the added playoff, they wouldn't have made it or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. Rick Renteria seemed like a good coach. He'd obviously, you know, meshed with those guys. Who knows? I mean, I guess, I guess, like they were really looking for that World Series caliber um, manager, and like Rick Renteria's really only managed kind of like shit teams. Like he managed those Cubs teams that were terrible. And that's pretty much it. Um, I don't know. I kind of feel bad for the guy, honestly. Yeah, I thought I I, I thought he was cut short too soon. But James yeah. had one, one other question. You said that Tommy Larusa, right? His name Tony. Tony. He, Tony, Tony, there he's coming in at 70 years of age and he doesn't sound like he has the best health habits coming in with multiple DUIs as well. This COVID hasn't gone away. COVID affects the older population at a higher rate than it does the younger, healthier population. So does Tony LaRusso make it to the season without stepping out for a couple of days because he's afraid of the coronavirus? Yeah, James, you're bringing up all the good questions and, you know, the good logic that I think most people would go into making to not hiring Tony Rusa. Uh, for whatever reason, the ownership of the White Sox disagrees with everything that you're saying and decided to do it anyway. Um, so I agree with you. I mean, he's, you know, you know COVID is going to be a concern for him. You know, he's, he's around these younger guys. COVID is going to spread at some point. There's a good chance that he might, you know, be exposed to it. Um, and that could be a problem. You know, so the White Sox hopefully have a plan in place for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this really, you ask any logical baseball mind, this, this move does not make any sense at all. You know, other, other than the fact that he does have a lot of good experience, you know, and he's won it before, he's won it several times. He, he, he is a Hall of Fame manager. He is in the Hall of Fame. So he is very good at what he does. But like, like I said, I think he's way past his prime. Um, so they're kind of, you know, almost, you know, digging it up from his grave, so to speak, uh, and kind of bringing it back and see if he can do it again. So we'll see what happens with that. to say. Yeah, we'll see. All right, moving on to the, uh, the Kansas City Royals here, who finished uh, fourth place in 2020 with a record of 26 and 24. 
uh, in the off season, they just uh, had a big trade. They got Andrew Benintendi from the, from the Red Sox. Um, they also signed relief pitcher Wade Davis, who won a World Series with them a few years ago. Uh, they signed first baseman Carlos Santana, and they also signed starting pitcher Mike Miner. Uh, so a few pretty decent moves there uh, for the offseason for, for, for the Royals. Uh, their projected rotation will be Danny Duffy, Brad Keller, Mike Miner, Chris Bubik, Bradley, or Brady Singer, and Jake Junis. Uh, the projected lineup will be catcher Salvador Perez, first baseman Carlos Santana, second baseman Nicky Lopez, shortstop Adalberto Mondesi, third baseman Hunter Dozier, outfielders Whit Merrifield, Andrew Benintendi, and Michael Taylor, and the DH will be Jorge Soler. Uh, the bad for this Royals team, uh, they're still in rebuild mode, um, so they're probably not going to win a whole lot of games. Um, their starting pitching lacks depth and will struggle. This is going to be not a great starting pitching staff. Uh, the good, uh, they got a great tool starting pitching prospect. So they got a lot of great young arms coming up through their system. So that's going to be something to, to look forward to. Um, the lineup will be competitive. I think this lineup offensively is pretty solid. Um, and they're pretty close, I would say, offensively to being a contender. Um, but I think they're just still waiting for those young pitchers to kind of come up through the system before they really start making moves. Um, so Alex, um, you had this team, your fiance is a huge Royals fan. So that's probably the reason why you picked to cover this team. That is, yeah. Um, yeah. So first question I want to ask you over under 75 wins on the season over. Okay. Over. Wow. I think is that because will... Ashley is listening? No, she's in the other room. <laughs> she's got the puppy. She has no idea what's going on. I gave her a, gla- a bottle of wine. We're good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I legitimately think this Royals team was going to be one of the more underrated teams in baseball. Think about it. Jorge Soler could lead the league in homers easily. Whit Merrifield could lead the lead in hits easily. Alberto Montesi could lead the league in steals. Their offense is good enough um, if Mike Miner can bounce back. He had a great year two years ago in Texas. Brady Singer had a really big um, first kind of first big year with them last year. If Danny Duffy can be anything like he used to be, Jacob Junis is pretty good. If their starting pitching can be good enough, I think they could be flirting with 500. All right. Um, I'm going to say they're going to be under. I think they're just, I, I, I just don't think the starting pitching is there yet. But speaking of starting pitching, um, they have three starting pitchers that are in MLB top 100 prospects uh, Asa Lacey, Daniel Lynch, and Jackson Cower. Um, some of these guys are projected to possibly make their debuts in 2021. Um, do you see any, any of these guys making their debuts and, you know, how, how do you see them performing if they, if, if they do? I think they're only going to make, they're going to make their debuts. If two things, if two things happens, if there's injuries in the rotation and they need innings, um, they'll do it. Um, they, they're not going to overthrow them. You know, they're not going to give them too many innings if they're trying to really build them up. I mean, look at teams like the Dodgers that have done that. And now all these guys are legit. So, you know, the Royals are – they're known for their pitching sometimes. They're pitching a defense. That's how they won their World Series. Um, or if they're actually competing, I mean, this AL Central is not a good division. Like, let's be completely honest. It's not a good division. If somehow they magically can squeak something in and they need these big arms to come up, they could, they could bring them in. Uh, will they perform well? I mean, they're probably not going to, you know – be Jacob DeGrom or somebody like that, but they're obviously talented young arms. Um, and we'll, we'll see, they could perform well. Um, you know, they got to, they get, they play the tigers. So that's always yeah. good. That is always <laughs> good. Yeah. I think the future is bright in Kansas city. I think they're very close to being very competitive. Um, so we'll see if any of those guys make their debuts in 2021. Uh, for me, I think they're going to finish under 500 right around 74 wins. Uh, they'll, they'll finish fourth, but I, but Alex, I, I do agree with you. I think that offense is dirty. I think they, they have a very good starting lineup and, and they could, they, they, they could uh, surprise some people. I mean, I, I think there's a very, a very realistic chance that they could finish better than the Indians this season. So we'll see. Um, moving on to the last place finishers in the AL central last year, the Detroit Tigers, uh, they finished fifth with a 23 and 35 record, a lot better than I think some people expected actually. Uh, off season, their biggest move was hiring former Astros cheater. I mean, manager, uh, AJ Hinch. Uh, they also signed outfielder, Nomar Maraza, infielder, Jonathan scope 
and catcher Wilson Ramos. Their projected rotation will be Matt Boyd, Spencer Turnbull, Michael Fulmer, Jose Urena, Tarek Skubal, that is a real name, I didn't make that up, uh, <laughs> Erasmo R- Ramirez, and we'll see if Casey Mize, their top pitching pro- prospect, will uh, make some, have some big league time in 2021. Um, their projected lineup will be catcher Wilson Ramos, first baseman Renato Nunez, second baseman Jonathan Scope, uh, shortstop Willie Castro, third baseman uh, Yamer Calendario. That's a tough one. Outfielder Nomar Miraza, uh, Robbie Grossman, and Jacoby Jones. And the DH will be the all time great Miguel Cabrera. Um, the bad with this team, they're still in rebuild mode. Um, they just don't have the talent yet to, to, to be to be competitive. Um, the good, they got a lot of good talent coming. They got the fifth ranked farm system in, in, the, in the bigs right now. Um, so, but I, I still think that there are a few years um, from getting to that point. Uh, so trading, the first thing I want to ask you uh, is about the AJ Hinch hire. Of course, you know, he had his one year suspension last year with the cheating scandal as a member of the Houston Astros. Um, he was hired on to uh, take the helm of this Tigers team. Um, As you look at A.J. Hinch, you know, he was kind of a scapegoat as part of that uh, cheating scandal. Wasn't really a leader of it, but he also didn't really do anything to stop it either. Um, That's a whole nother podcast for discussion. But do you think that this will be a negative distraction for the Tigers, or do you think that he will contribute to this team's future success? I mean, some of the players have already come out and said, let's play baseball. Let's move on. Let's it's in the past. Let's move on. And I know that you, I mean, you guys in baseball and and the baseball community, this left a black eye for, for the entire league. This left a black eye for, I mean, a huge black eye for AJ Hinch. Um, So, but I I just think that Detroit's in a point where they're in rebuild mode and they're going to, they're it's either you either let this guy do what he does and not let the issues in the past become a distraction or you, you know, let you let them become a distraction, and you completely, you know, you completely throw out everything that you've been building for the last that you've been tanking for for the last, you know, so some years. I actually like to hire. Um, I, you know, I know that he he didn't help really do much to prevent the issue, the you know, the cheating issues. But here's the deal: like, the guy is a good manager. He's very good. I mean, he's done a very good. He did a very good job with the Astros. Uh, you know, going in. Um, back in 2015 where he did not have a losing season the, the Houston Astros never had a losing season under under Hinch that, that's that's a big thing and they were they were not they were dog shit before that um it, you know he's he's done well developing players um and I think that he you know he's interesting because everyone talks about how he's an analytical like he's he's analytical he thinks about the analytical side but he also uses that to, you know, they, they, they kind of consider him a baseball guy with, with an appreciation for the analytics as opposed to an analytical guy who doesn't know the baseball. You know what I mean? Like he has the, he has the eye for, for the baseball side, unlike, you know, whoever the manager of the, of the, um, you know, Rays is, you know, that, that issue would have never happened under, under, uh, under AJ Hinch. I would like to think. Because you know he he looks at he looks at things kind of holistically and and he and he uses that to you know makes decisions. He's I think he's going to be a good communicator. I think he's going to be very good for this. As you said, the 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 minor league the 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 farm system is very deep and very strong, and I think that he's going to do very good in already starting to create th- you know create a new culture and 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 bring up these kids and and develop them and i think that the, i think to your point i think that the um the tigers have a good future ahead of them for sure i would agree with you i think with that whole astros uh cheating part of it um i think everyone kind of knows at this point it was really the, the pl- players that drove that aj hinch really didn't have a part of creating it um you know and he did try and stop it a few times he just wasn't successful and probably could have done more you know, he served his uh, suspension. Um, I think, as you mentioned, he is a very good manager and he did lead those Astros to success. Um, so I, I think he is going to do great in Detroit and I, ho- and I hope he does. I think, I think if, if anyone deserves a redemption of, from that whole story, it is AJ Hinch. So I hope he does well in Detroit. Um, 
Second question for you, trading. You know, it's a rebuild season. Another one. It's been a very long time since this Tigers team has been very good. Um, so we're it's probably going to be another long season. You know, probably close to 100 losses again. So, what do you have to look forward to for this 2021 season? You know, you 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 just look you look forward to to a new process. You look forward to a new to to you know starting something new with this with AJ Hinch and him. He's not going like no one can tell me that he that he's not happy about what happened or that he's happy about what happened with the whole you know fallout. He's going to do everything he can to to redeem himself. And I think that that alone is something that the Detroit Tigers fans should should hang on to and say, hey, it's going to be a tough year. But to your point last year, they did better than even you expected. Yep. And we might see that that leap this year. And I don't think I don't think I think they're done tanking. They have they have the they have the farm system. They have the players in place that they that they can start to develop. That's what you're looking forward to. You're looking forward to what your future is going to be. And you know, sometimes that's all you got as a fan and you just got to appreciate, Hey, this is something new. Maybe this is something that we can hang on to. And I'm glad you gave me this team because this team kind of feels like an, like, the, you know, the, the Edmonton Oilers in a sense where they had, they've had so many problems for years and years. And, and we finally, you know, they finally get some, um, you know, some stability at the, at the base of it, at the front office, some new, some new blood, something that someone's going to come in there and change this organization. And I think the Tigers fans should be very happy about that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you just try and look for the positives. I think, like, as I mentioned, there are a lot, there's a lot of good young talent coming through this system. It's just a matter of time. I think they got the right leadership in place. Um, it's just a few more years of just ugly baseball, but I think the Tigers are coming. Um, just give them a, just give them a, a couple more seasons. You know, this is one of the, mo the most historic franchises in sports. You know, they for a while there in the you know, kind of the late, you know, 2010s, early uh, 20 teens or whatever you call that time. Um, they were pretty good and they made the World Series uh, a, a couple of times and, and fell short. You know, I would love to see the Tigers come back. Um, I think that that fan base in Detroit deserves it. But as far as 2021 goes, it's going to be another losing season. I'm going to give them 60 wins and they'll finish last again in the AL central. So real quick to wrap up this segment, we're, we're going to go around the horn and see everyone's final, final uh, standings pr predictions. Uh, so starting off, um, I'm going to go with the twins will win the uh, AL central and second place will be the white Sox. Third will be the Indians fourth, the Royals and fifth, the Tigers. James, what do you got? Twins, white Sox, Royals, Indians, and Tigers. All right. Alex. God damn it. James. <laughs> Uh, I got White Sox, Twins, Royals, Indians, Tigers. All right. And trade in. Yeah, I got uh, Twins, White Sox, Indians, Royals, Tigers. All right. So are we all agree if the Twins will win except for Alex, who's going to pick the White Sox, which that will be a really good race between the Twins and the White Sox. Um, I think the Twins are slightly more well-rounded. And that Tony La Russa thing is going to be real interesting. I think for me, that's the biggest story to watch in, this, in the AL Central this year. Um, but James, that's all I got for the AL Central. Great, dude. I love it. That was another really good division preview. I look forward to next week when I get to talk about my team, yeah. the Angels, and how they're going to win that division. That'll be fun. <laughs> all right, everybody. That uh, pretty much wraps up episode 34. Hey, uh, look, you guys all have that one friend who doesn't know that much about sports. Send him this podcast. Do yourself a favor. Do hit them a favor. Everybody can learn about sports. Now you can talk about sports this podcast. And if sports aren't your thing, go ahead and check out the new series that's talking about life, where we talk about life and not just sports. Um, find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>